The King of New Orleans. By Greg Klein. Introduction. This is a story of a famous dog from Atomic Dog by George Clinton. In 1979 in the Deep South, wrestling promoter Cowboy Bill Watts and his top lieutenants, Booker's Big Cat Ernie Ladd and Grizzly Smith, made a decision that can only be called counterintuitive. Well, that's not entirely correct. The rest of the wrestling world, when news of the decision trickled out, most likely called it crazy. Watts wrestled and played college football at the University of Oklahoma before he became a main event pro wrestler. He had just taken over part of the wrestling federation formerly known as Tri-State Wrestling from his partner, Leroy McGurk, a former junior heavyweight world champion. Watts and McGurk had fundamental differences in business philosophy that were underscored by a 1978 wrestling card at the Louisiana Superdome, a huge New Orleans venue that's home to the National Football League's New Orleans Saints. Watts would dub the event, the Super Show at the Superdome. The July 22nd card was the third that the group had run in its biggest venue in its biggest and soon-to-be best city. The main event was historic, because it featured two black wrestlers. Ladd, the former San Diego Charger and a growing wrestling legend, played the heel, the bad guy. A wrestler named Ray Candy, a massive man with good charisma but little in the way of wrestling ability, played the babyface. With a solid build-up and good promotion, the event drew 23,800 fans and produced $142,675 of gate revenue, both records for the group and outstanding figures for any wrestling promotion at the time. It was obvious to everyone that Tri-State had done an incredible job of drawing black fans to the arena, and those fans erupted with joy when their hero, Candy, beat Ladd. After the show, McGurk was asked what he thought about the card. He responded with a racial slur, in effect saying that he disliked seeing a crowd and matches filled with black people. Watts has said that the person who responded was Grizzly Smith, another veteran wrestler turned Booker and Watts's longtime lieutenant. Smith told the Krusty and, ironically, blind McGurk that the fans were all a single color. It's called their money's green and it's the most green we've seen in a long time, and Smith said. In other words, by putting two black wrestlers in the main event, and specifically putting a black wrestler as the lead good guy, the promotion had increased the amount of black fans in the audience, and therefore the amount of money the promoters made. The lesson was lost on McGurk, but not on the other businessmen in the room. Watts soon forced a split with his partner, taking the states of Louisiana and Mississippi and keeping the Superdome shows, as the crown jewel of the new territory he named Mid-South Wrestling. McGurk took Oklahoma and neighboring Arkansas for his group. Within a few years, he would be out of business. Watts, on the other hand, would soon be the talk of the wrestling world. Ladd and Smith, who agreed with Watts about the promotion's direction, wound up working for him. However, to give the fans what they wanted, a black superhero and biddable champion of good in a land of racial hatred and violence, they needed a black athlete to be their franchise player. Watts believed that Candy was not the man for this job. Despite his charisma, he was more of a round, jolly fellow. He would later weight more than 400 pounds. Instead, the athletic Watts wanted someone with an athletic background, someone who looked good, who looked like he was a wrestler. He didn't have to look long or far for his superhero. Sylvester Ritter was born on December 13, 1952, in Wadesboro, North Carolina, not far from Charlotte. A natural athlete, he was good at track and field and wrestling and excellent at football. He played college ball at nearby Fayetteville State and got tryouts with the Houston Oilers and Green Bay Packers, but knee and back injuries put a quick end to his football career. By 1977, he had made his way into professional wrestling. He started wrestling for an outlaw group in the Carolinas, but soon moved to more legitimate territories, with twin tours for the two big Tennessee promoters, Jerry Jarrett and Nick Gulas, in western and eastern parts of the state, respectively. Ritter ventured into tri-state territory early in his career. Watts liked his potential, but thought he was a disaster in the ring. Ritter wrestled as a heel jobber during his first run in the territory, losing virtually all of his matches. In contrast to his later career, when JYD would crush foes in a minute or less, most of his early losses were quick squashes, matches where he got in little offense. Watts ended up telling Ritter that he had a place for him if he could go off and learn how to work. The promoter fired him, Ladd said shortly before his death in a 2006 interview with SteelBellTrestling.com. That's how bad he was. But he also told him when you learn your skill, your craft, your trade, you come back and we'll use you. And the rest is history. The place he learned was Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Getting booked in Canada's most storied territory took an incredible confluence of events. Grizzly Smith's son known in the business as Jake Roberts, was heading into Canada and suggested Ritter come with him. Ritter had already met several key members of the Hart family, sons of legendary Calgary promoter Stu Hart. 
In his first year in the business, Ritter got booked onto some tours in Puerto Rico and Germany. He had met Brett and Smith Hart in Puerto Rico. In Germany he met Stu's oldest son, Bruce Hart, who handled the booking and office duties for Stampede Wrestling. Bruce hired Ritter, brought him to Calgary, and gave him his first main event push in the business. They nicknamed him Big Daddy Ritter, and gave him a gimmick that bordered on offensive. He was portrayed as the big, black womanizer. Vlad himself would play that role at various points in his career as a bad guy, but more regularly his success came from simply being a monster heel who could crush smaller, often white, opponents. The gimmick worked well enough in Roughneck Canada. Ritter won his first singles title, the Calgary version of the North American title, and enjoyed his first stint headlining. In fact, the gimmick worked so well that long after Ritter had left Calgary they were still using a variation of it with longtime Calgary heel Bad News Allen. During his run in Calgary, Ritter feuded in the ring with Jake Roberts. By this time Watts was breaking away from Tri-State and his old partner McGurk. Roberts planned to join his father, and invited Ritter to return. In light of Calgary's bitterly cold winters, the oddball, and of the world nature of the city's wrestling scene, and his headline run winding down, Ritter agreed. Soon they were mid-south bound. New Orleans has had more than its share of racial problems. A port city was one of the biggest hubs of the slave trade of the 17th and 18th centuries. It also had its share of Jim Crow era abuses, including hangings, lynchings, and Ku Klux Klan, KKK, offenses. In the 50s and 60s, there were civil rights marches and protests. When desegregation hit, the city experienced a wave of white flight, first to the suburbs of Jefferson Parish and the west bank of the Mississippi River, and, later, across the vast Lake Pontchartrain to places like Slidell, Mandeville, and Covington. In 1956, the Louisiana legislature passed a law banning interracial sporting events. The law did not last. However, the backlash to the civil rights era did. In 1965, the year after the landmark civil rights bill passed, the American Football League, AFL, scheduled its all-star game at Tulane Stadium, the forerunner to the Superdome in terms of its civic importance to New Orleans. Black AFL players found a hostile reception from local business owners and were denied service at many hotels and restaurants. So, backed by their white teammates, the football players went on strike. They stayed united, and the game ended up being moved to Houston. In many ways, it was the success of black athletes in football and other sports that convinced Watts that he needed black wrestling stars. Pro wrestling always had a code of protecting the business, a code sometimes called kayfabe, and promoters and wrestlers went to great lengths to make sure fans believed the sport was real. Watts, with his own football background, took this effort to greater lengths than most. He went to extremes to stress his wrestlers' athleticism, and he often sought out and groomed men who, like him, had backgrounds in football or amateur wrestling. He also made sure his in-ring and out-of-ring storylines were logical. He took angles that worked in other territories and fine-tuned them until they made sense for his promotion. In fact, one of his biggest angles of all time would need just such a spin. Because black athletes were excelling in all the other sports, Watts felt that it would expose the business as being fake if no big wrestling stars were black. There had been black wrestling stars up to that point, but none had ever been the star in a promotion, and none excited Watts. He did have some options, however. Ladd himself had been a huge wrestling star since he walked away from pro football stardom a decade earlier. Moreover, Ladd and Watts were great friends and frequent business partners in main events and in Mid-South. Later they would bond over Christ and Republican politics, as well. However, Ladd was a natural heel. His success came from being a great talker and an imposing figure. He made the perfect foil for a white babyface as the huge, mean black man, but he wasn't cut out to be a black superhero. His knees were giving out, and his run was petering out by the late 70s. His career would end completely in 1984. Other potential stars were similarly played out. Georgia wrestler Thunderbolt Patterson had great charisma as a babyface, but had been around wrestling for decades and no one trusted him enough to base their business on him. Watts and Ladd would use him for special shows, but they felt his personal issues were too much to overcome. Bobo Brazil was a black wrestler who had been a huge babyface star dating back to the 50s, but he likely wasn't considered. With the exception of Washington, D.C., where he was the top star, Brazil almost always wrestled in semi-main events, rather than main events, and, like many ethnic babyfaces geared toward bringing in specific audiences, he rarely lost matches, due to the fear of riots. Watts would also use Mr. USA Tony Atlas, a favorite of the Atlanta promotion, who was ahead of the curve in terms of steroid-era muscle men. But what Atlas had in mass he lacked in charisma, in ring skills, and interview technique. Another option, Rocky Johnson, aka the Soul Man, 
and father of wrestler turned movie star The Rock Dwayne Johnson, had more charisma and better interview skills, but like Ladin Patterson, had been around forever. Rather than go with an older wrestler, Watts decided to find someone he could groom. He had heard about Ritter's progress from Smith, who had heard about it from his son. They invited Ritter back into Mid-South with the idea of grooming him for stardom. The rest wasn't exactly history, and there were certainly problems along the way. For one thing, New Orleans, the state of Louisiana, and the rest of the territory were still feeling the backlash of the civil rights era. New Orleans, in particular, had become a troubled city in the 70s. Crime was rampant. The police response was to crack down overwhelmingly on the black community, causing resentment and anger. More than 60% of the city's population was black, but the police and the politicians were almost all white. Civil rights-style protests and rallies sprang up. In 1977, the city elected its first black mayor Ernest Dutch Morial. New Orleans was ripe for a black wrestler to be its top star, as for the rest of the territory, that question was still open. In 1975, the Superdome opened. Home to the Saints, the Dome replaced Tulane Stadium and rivaled the smaller Astrodome in Houston as an indoor sports venue. At the time, the NFL teams only played 14 games a year, so the Saints only had seven regular season home games. Sensing the Dome's need for other events, and the huge money that could be made from running a successful wrestling show, Tri-State's local TV affiliate, WGNO, suggested that McGurk and Watts run a Superdome show in 1976. In exchange for free advertising, the station and the promotion would split the gate revenue. On July 17, 1976, National Wrestling Alliance world champion Terry Funk defended his title against Watts, winning when the match was stopped because Watts was bleeding excessively. A local rivalry was featured in the semi-main event, in which Dick Murdoch beat Killer Carl Cox. The show drew 17,000 fans and about $75,000 in gate revenue. The show's spectacular success didn't immediately spawn a return engagement. New Orleans had been considered a dead city for so many years, decades even, that there was caution about running a show in the city regularly, let alone one in a venue the size of the Superdome. With the high cost associated with the show, and Lord knows how many payoffs that went along with running in the corrupt, good old boy world of Louisiana politics, the promotion decided to wait and run the Dome only with loaded-up shows and main events with super-hot build-up. They didn't return until April 1978. The third Superdome show featured Ladd vs. Candy on July 22 of that year. From then on the Superdome show became a regular event, held three to five times a year, with booking done to lead up to and climax at the Dome. Since much of the July 78 crowd came from walk-ups and same-day sales, and much of that crowd was black, it was clear what the promotion needed. Well, it was clear to everyone but McGurk. Ritter arrived in Mid-South in late 1979 looking like a star. At 300 pounds, he was tall, athletic, and probably already enhanced by steroids. He looked like a champion, had charisma, and could do a decent interview. When Watts, one of wrestling's better talkers, got through with him, Ritter could do a great interview. However, what he couldn't really do was work, perform a realistic-looking match, which was ironic, since he had been a decent high school wrestler. For Watts, this presented a dilemma, as he had based much of his territory's cred on realism. However, he felt he could sell Ritter as an athlete, if not actually program him to be a mighty worker in the ring. Therefore, he decided that Ritter had enough of the qualities he was looking for, and his limitations could be handled. For a ring name, Watts chose the Junkyard Dog based on a line from Jim Croce's song Bad, Bad Leroy Brown which went, badder than old King Kong, meaner than a junkyard dog. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that most everyone in the wrestling world expected him to fail. They expected Watts to fail, that is, not the junkyard dog, the wrestling world at large mostly had no idea who JYD was. After all, despite Watts's polish as a booker, and a main eventer, he was featuring an unknown, inexperienced black wrestler as his leading star in a dead region for wrestling, including a city with little history of supporting the sport. Even McGurk, the source of so much conflict with Watts, must have thought he'd put one over on his partner. Oklahoma had always been the heart of Tri-State. When his wrestlers ended up in Louisiana and Mississippi in the old days, it usually meant they were being punished with smaller venues, crowds, and, worst of all, paydays. Conventional wisdom, as it so often does, proved to be wrong when it came to Watts, JYD, in the New Mid-South. At first, JYD came to the ring with a wheelbarrow full of junk, a wrestling version of the television show Sanford and Son that gimmick didn't stick. However, another one did stick, a dog collar around JYD's neck that was attached to a steel chain. In fact, the gimmick would be used for JYD's specialty grudge matches, called dog collar matches, 
and would be with him for the rest of his wrestling career. Music played a big role in JYD's success, too. Before music videos and before most wrestlers had theme songs, Queen's Another One Bites the Dust would shake and groove to announce JYD's entrance. Later, he added a song called Atomic Dog by George Clinton to the mix, as well. The music worked. One by one, all of Mid-South's villains did indeed bite the dust. To make up for JYD's lack of in-ring skills, his matches were kept short, often he won in two minutes or less. It added to the effect. Not only could he beat every bad guy in town, but he dispatched them in quick fashion, much quicker than the other babyfaces in town usually did. Junkyard dog doesn't get paid by the hour, Watts would often say. Quickly, J.Y. took his spot at the top of the wrestling cards and was winning title belts. Watts met more than a little resistance from the old, white guard who, like McGurk, disliked all the black faces in the crowd. More than that, however, they hated the idea of a big, superhuman black man taking everything the white villains could throw at him and dispatching them as if they were nothing. Watts defended his star and his business with the utmost seriousness. He was even known to threaten a good old boy or two. Given his history of violent confrontations, Watts undoubtedly would have made good on his threats, if necessary. In less than a year, Mid-South, particularly New Orleans, was on fire. JYD's first appearance at the Superdome came on August 2, 1980. He headlined the show and attracted the biggest gate and crowd in the Dome's history. The show also set the U.S. attendance record for an indoor wrestling event. The gate shocked the rest of the wrestling world. Two wrestlers no one had heard of, and a promoter most everyone expected to fail, had gone into a dead wrestling city and come up with one of the biggest crowds in history. Their money's green and it's more than we've seen in a long time, Smith had said two years earlier. For the next four years, they would see a lot more green with JYD on top. JYD's popularity extended around the territory, and to whites as well as blacks. Watts soon claimed Oklahoma and Arkansas from McGurk, and worked out a deal with Houston promoter Paul Bosch to extend into Texas. However, nowhere in Mid-South, or even in all of America, was a city and a wrestler more on fire than JYD and New Orleans. Through weekly cards at the downtown municipal auditorium, dubbed the Dog's Yard, and the regular Superdome shows, New Orleans likely drew more than one million fans over a four- or five-year period. No other city in America even came close to that figure. Worldwide, probably only Tokyo and Mexico City did better, and they were the two biggest cities on the planet, 20 or 30 times larger than New Orleans, and with multiple wrestling promotions. New Orleans and Mid-South fans believed in their hero and ferociously, sometimes violently, hated his opponents. As JYD dispatched heel after heel and worked his way into grudge match after grudge match, a chant began to form that is now part of New Orleans lore for another reason. Who dat? Who dat? Who dat think they gonna beat that dog? The origins of the Who dat chant have caused controversy in New Orleans, where fans of the 2010 Super Bowl champion Saints are called the Who dat Nation. Several facts are not in dispute. The phrase dates back to late 19th century minstrel lyrics. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a black poet of some regard, wrote the lyrics to a song called, Who Dat Say Chicken in This Crowd for a show performed by a troupe led by Edward E. Rice. The saying caught on, and was passed along through other forms of entertainment, particularly in the black community in the South. A popular 20th century vaudeville routine played it as a riff, asking, Who Dat Say Who Dat? Harpo Marx even picked up on the phrase and used it in a song called Gabriel, Who Dat Man? In the 1937 movie A Day at the Races. In 1983, a music studio operator heard the chant at a Saints game and recorded a version as part of the chorus to When the Saints Go Marching In. The studio owner, Steve Monastir, recruited country music star Aaron Neville to record the song. A local sports anchor, former baseball player Ron Swoboda, got the exclusive rights to air the song on his Monday night football pregame show, and the song and the chant became part of Saints lore. All of this information was noted by the New Orleans Times-Picayune in a 2009 front-page article by Dave Walker. The piece ran more than a full page and thousands of words, yet never mentioned the junkyard dog. However, even Walker notes the controversy over the origins. Early in the 1983 football season, Swoboda's colleague, high school sports anchor Ken Bertolo, rode with a local high school team, the St. Augustine Purple Knights, as they went to a game. The players on the bus chanted, who dat talk about beating St. August? Swoboda heard the chant on some footage Bertolo brought back to the studio. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, he said. Soon, he started playing the chant several times a week on his sports reports. At the same time, the chant began to be used for the Saints. However, the chant predated St. August in the 1979 football state championship. Patterson High School, the Patterson, Louisiana, 
upset New Orleans powerhouse John Curtis in the Superdome in the 2A championship. The Patterson fans chanted for their lumberjacks, who dat sat there going to beat those jacks? Football chants are bound to be copied and spread around, much as cheers from cheerleaders get heard and picked up by rival squads. However, the chant for the junkyard dog may be the missing link that brought the chant to the Saints. JYD's rise to stardom in 79 inspired his own Houdat chant. His fame grew with the 1980 Superdome match, and the chant was ubiquitous for him in New Orleans until his departure from Mid-South in 1984. In 1983, both St. Augustine and the Saints started the chant, as well. It is possible, of course, that junkyard dog's Houdat chant didn't directly lead to the Saints' Houdat cheer in the same building. However, JYD has been erased from the timeline completely, not just by Walker in the Times Picayune. The junkyard dog is a forgotten hero both in New Orleans, where he was once king, and throughout the Deep South, where his superhero push defied conventional wisdom and perhaps even common sense. His decline in wrestling after leaving Mid South in 1984 and his untimely death in a 1998 car accident have taken him away from us, not just in body, but in spirit, too. This book aims to correct that mistake. The story returns to a time where race relations in New Orleans and in the South provided fresh scars and deep wounds, often literal ones, to its black population. The story chronicles the promoter and bookers who recognized the legions of black fans who longed for one of their own on top, and responded by giving those fans the first ever black wrestler to be the absolute star of the show. Most of all the story looks at the man they chose, Sylvester Ritter, the junkyard dog, his tragic life and wonderful, if limited, run as an icon of New Orleans and superhero of the South. Somewhere deep in the memories of the city and the region, and in the hearts of the wrestling fans that came of age in the late 70s and early 80s, the junkyard dog lives. The story is for them.